Okay, as I promised you, hello. Uh, Another day of Film Spring Open. Uh, uh, just a few organiza organizational remarks I would like to ask you that if you have some sort of ideas or some sort of claims or worries, please uh, address me directly. I'm here all the time. The Film Spring Open is a sort of a production idea. We're not copying anyone. We're trying to listen listen to uh, everybody, and this is how it happened that this strange uh, festival was created. Uh, it's not functioning as it should have uh, been functioning. Bliżej do mikrofonu, proszę. Nie słyszę. Jest za cicho. Please write to my web address or directly, please write directly to me. Uh, I need to also make a certain excuse concerning certain confusion that uh, accompanies uh, many people that I'm sort of a... Oh, that, that, uh, I need to change my tone of voice, maybe. There is a certain confusion that I talk a lot about production. Today I will be talking more about the directing and what uh, concerns uh, directors. However, it's, uh, the, the, the situation is such that I do, uh, I know how cinematographers work. Uh, my I know how my colleague is doing his pictures, but I, I, he never invited me to his set. But it did, did 70 films altogether, and my whole life was one big school or university. And I met all sorts of uh, people from uh, total failures to great directors. I made a lot of debuts. So all this knowledge that accompanied me uh, throughout those times uh, authorizes me in a way to talk about things which go outside uh, beyond my uh, scope of duty. I also, uh, have, I also did uh, a few films myself uh, as a director. I believe that it's always worth it whenever we're starting a film, filming project to, to realize certain, a certain rule, which I call the rule of uh, superfluity. We're living in times when we are being uh, flooded by, by absolutely too many offers and proposals, too many screens. Loads of uh, suggestions, loads of options, and especially by an extremely strong uh, film studio um, apparatus, which is very difficult to, to, to break through. Uh, it evokes certain psychological uh, phenomena in our viewers. The first phenomenon is what I call uh, the uh, impatience level uh, of our viewer rises significantly. What at some point was a normal setup time uh, in uh, when you introduced the viewer in the story of the film, what functioned very well and answered to the re requirements of the viewer. And it right now is becoming shorter and shorter, and sometimes the structure is being built topsy turvy, and sometimes the strongest uh, scene of the film is in the beginning, so in order to cap to captivate the viewer or, or capture his attention and then the film goes on. Uh, Amelie, for example, is a structure like that where the beginning of the film is dramaturgically the strongest part of the movie. When you start this work, when you start the project, uh, it's always good to think how to catch your viewer, and you have to remember about that. It's also good to remember about something which is, abs is absolutely absent, in, uh, especially in film schools. I have this feeling that uh, a film school student believes that people are waiting for his film. Yes, I, he believes I will uh, 
uh, throw everybody on their knees. I myself, however, see many attitudes, and from the point of uh, exposition, they start as a big, just like a long feature film, but they last only for a few minutes. This expectation and this feeling that the world is waiting for us is wrong, because it also lulls our uh, attention and it makes you build a wrong strategy. I always, I'm always saying, which might be slightly exaggerated, but it is a certain point of view, that when you imagine a viewer who hates you, who does not want to see your film, and he really uh, does not care about you, it makes you, uh, it's, it makes it much easier to break through uh, this barrier that I told about, this error that I told you about in a moment ago. Uh, Remember that we are a game. We are being we are hunt, we are being hunted. People are shooting at us from all sides. So if you're thinking, uh, so when you think uh, this sort of thinking uh, makes producers make good films. Uh, I don't remember exactly which the, the film which was shown in Cannes was shown some time ago. It was really good and really made according to this psych uh, philosophy. Uh, you have to remember that that even if if you have a good film, you know, a too long an exposition can make it totally unsurvivable in a multiplex or on TV. Remember that people have a, a remote control which they allow you to turn off your TV at once. I proposed uh, this uh, um, lecture uh, because it was supposed to be a, an element of the lecture of, about new model of production, but it's such a broad uh, um, topic. I started with a very product on the production side, uh, and now I wanted to tell you something which is also very important. I should have made it quite the opposite way. In initially, I should I should have started with the risk control and risk management, and only then what tools should be used for that. Well, my statement is very easy and very simple. There are scripts which are great, and great scripts make sometimes very poor movies. And also we have so-so scripts we, where we did not get the intention, let's say it's not a typical genre film, and we, or we think that it's in general mediocre, and we get great films from that. And the system in which we're functioning is built exactly on the fact that this to be or not to be part is the acceptance point of the script. So financing of the film appears at the moment where, when the script gets a green light, a go-ahead, and later what happens, and many different things may happen later, it leads to, a situa to, to many unfortunate situations, and, uh, appa an, uh, an apparently accepted uh, text makes sometimes, I'm sorry, uh, a shit on a stick, sorry, for, uh, pardon my French. Uh, is there a possibility to avoid that? Yes, of course, this is what we were talking about during my la last lecture. Uh, it was like a sh there's a short. Uh, we were talking about this uh, um, difference between the digital system and, uh, and the standard film. Mm. It was a necessity at some point. You could not see any other uh, intermediate form uh, for a script. They were, for example, realized in Poland. And this was also, it also positioned in a way the role of a Polish uh, film. Uh, we, we wrote together with the director as a, a technical script in a way, which resulted from many reasons. The, one of the main reasons was that the relation of the uh, amount of film, the, the physical film we had to record a, a movie was 
one, two, four, or one, two, five. So which means if now you, you get 50 times as much material as you want to enter, uh, get into a movie, this model of making a film uh, is totally different from all, what was before. The times that are surrounding us right now are times where selection is important. In other words, from any American movie plan, from the material you get on the set, uh, where you get, you could, you could get 20 or 30 other films, not using the shots from the wrong, the, from the uh, original selection. You, you get so much material in the shooting. So this is also an element which tells us that the script uh, and the material you get in the beginning is not even just, it's not even notation, is an initial document. And this uh, American template is not the best, it's not an optimal solution. However, uh, just to give you a, a good example, in the beginning, let's say you have a white script, and then you get all uh, colors of the rainbow at the end. So there's a number of writers who replace scenes during the filming. Uh, this is then the uh, every change is made on a different color of the uh, uh, of, a, of a paper. So at the end, you get very few white papers. So it also shows you how many changes were made. The difference between a script and what is what is at the end is can be huge. A drastic example of that was a film uh, Blue by Kishlovsky, which was written as a psychological drama. So it was clearly a genre, film, a, a genre film where a journalist is making an inquiry. Uh, or she was supporting uh, uh, her, uh, and, and the film that we got finally was a, absolutely a musical film. The role of a journalist was was limited from ten major scenes to only one scene, and the method of uh, uh, editing of this film was much more uh, dreamlike. Gatunkowego w tym wypadku psychologicznego. And it was it was very much. Do you have do we have tools for that? Yes, of course. What I was telling, I told about that in my previous lecture. I will I will relate quite often to my previous lecture. We can do a preface. We can do pre-editing of. We can make a, like a, a, an initial template version of our of, of the film we want to prepare, and here. Um, we have this opportunity which is uh, in, uh, disquieting for many uh, producers. Ah, another they think because it's another barrier to make the, li the life of an artist more difficult and his approach to, f to, to money more difficult. Uh, what I'm suggesting here is uh, I'm not suggesting this as uh, I'm not suggesting an inst institutional form and I'm not uh, trying to convince you being on your side of the of the wall and I would like uh, uh, just remember that the script is an absolutely uh, first draft because plenty of things will be lacking there this should be a tool that supports the director but also the crew and it supports many elements but, I will, but w before I talk about Previs and its advantages, I will tell you how I imagine that. Imagine that. You know, in, for for big productions, there are special companies which do Previses. They even have a trade union in the United States, and they make it in many different uh, computer programs. Jakub, uh, my my friend uh, uh, Krzysztof said about that uh, a few days ago. Uh, it's an animated version of the film. Why animated? Because it relates mainly a film where uh, there's a large percentage of artificial things, CGI's. So due to the fact it's difficult to imagine that differently. 
And the second more important element is that they treat Previs as some sort of a financial product. And by drawing things, you can always do exaggeration. You can add a few extras. You, you can make a monster which has like 50, which is 50 meters high. You can do almost anything. And this type of exaggeration, in when you're looking for a sponsor for the money, uh, and you try to convince people, which is very difficult in any way, but here is actually very advantageous. So American premises are mainly made as um, uh, like uh, in the form of animatics. I believe that we need that also in Europe, and all what I'm saying here, uh, the new production model, uh, and uh, and all the cinebus and everything I do here was is supposed to to relate to small to small productions. So we do not need exactly the American way. I'm not touching the world of big money because there will be no big money for you. And so let's limit ourselves to the thinking about things which is opportunity for making a film for small money and not wasting your time and waiting for months and years for for getting huge money for a historical or um, uh, the period, periodic movie. As your debut. Uh, there's the one th more thing should be said, which also uh, helps you in thinking and shows you certain uh, necessity. And the necessity it does not uh, relate to the script, but uh, it relates to certain mentality. You should remember that a student of a film school. Uh, makes short forms and he love he would love to make a feature film this is his dream you can compare it to a situation as if you you had a sportsman who was training for 100 meters and then you made it make him run a marathon i saw it with my own very eyes i worked with the director who went to, who was dr driven to hospital after two weeks he was sitting in front of a computer for four years he was writing a script and during the first day of the of the filming he started to run around uh, and uh, because he was also playing in the in this film and he fell down and he had to be reanimated uh, uh, resuscitated and he had to be uh, they, they had to calm him down in the hospital because he sort of depleted himself in no time so this need to understand that uh, we are living in a certain genre of a, of a movie is also a men think of men mentality if you if you're thinking about the quickness of telling a story getting into certain format uh, if you're thinking about the conditions of a festival or you know quite often the short forms are limited by by budget mainly uh, you just have enough money to do um, such a production no more but later, when you're standing in front, behind the camera and you, you need to get a different distance, your mentality changes, your point of view changes, and uh, today I will be um, talking a lot about what Jagoda Scherz was talking about, uh, about issues related to short films. Well, she said, do as many films as you can, do even bad films. Of course, it is in a certain conflict uh, um, uh, with the film schools which which uh, penalize you for making bad films, which according to the professors, which from the point of view of teaching is a, is a total idiocy. I will not talk about that. Those of you who have been at my, uh, in this lecture, they know what I'm talking about. Film schools quite often do not understand their function uh, towards the student. They do not understand the fact that it's the only time and place in their life where the students can experiment. It's not the teaching of painting or teaching of creative writing. I do have a feeling that film schools, in large part, uh, resemble uh, the, the university of penmanship. You know, uh, you have classes, classes about how the cameras are built, and there are plenty of people who are still thinking in analog, and they re re remind those, you know, they love to talk about those times and technologies. So the the technologies are quite, uh, you know, delayed in terms of today's world. What is my view of a previs of a film of which I have a script? Uh, the script is an, uh, a condition 
competition to make a premise. Three years ago, we made a, a competition for premises, and it's from the outset you could see from the first moments whether these premises were made after the script was was made. We didn't ask about the script, but it, you could see that whether somebody was improvising or he did a script. Of course, you can imagine things. You can do a premise um, so that you do not have a script, but uh, you know there are no rules in this world, but I believe that the ground, the f foundation for the film should be a written script, and only then you should try to, to process it in any way. Let's say we have a film in a f on a full sea, a yacht, a psychological drama with elements of a thriller, uh, on the yacht, but all this premise can be done here on the on the stage in the corner, because apart from the visual effects and the, and the whole complicated uh, uh, situations of uh, having our actors uh, wet at all times, uh, there is a basis for all this, so, which means characters, dialogues, uh, the length of uh, your movie, the method uh, of I mean, the way the uh, characters change. Remember that we quite often do not uh, make films in chronological way because of the financial reasons. Quite often we have to start with a scene, we have to start with the end scene, and it's a melodrama, and there are certain uh, levels of emotions between those people. So it's especially significant in those undefined things. It's quite difficult where our actors we will end up emotionally. Quite often I do films with, where from the very beginning until the end there is so much emotion that does not have any leveling. And this is also related to the, you know, sometimes you can see directors on the, on the, um, uh, along a beautiful palace when he says this is beautiful and this is even more beautiful, this is even, even more beautiful. But there should be a structure, there are things which are important and things which are more important, there has to be certain leveling, staging. You, sh you, sh you need to realize what should be in the beginning, what should be at the end of the film, which is a very important dramaturgical turning point uh, and where you can sort of realize, you, where, where you can process or realize an, uh, a scene qu quicker. quicker. You sh there should be a certain rhythm. If you do not have a rhythm, you lack the direction of the film. Andrei Vaida, was sleeping on the set. He always had hundreds of uh, assistants. He, he would always sort of doze off. And I asked him, Andre, you're always sleeping on the set. What's happening? And he said, Slavic, it's so easy. I open my eyes and something surprises me. And I know it's good. If I open my eyes and it doesn't surprise me, I mean, I know it's bad. Of course, it's an exaggeration. Andre was famous for th those sort of quotations. Uh, uh, I will tell you one more, which is not related to this um, lecture. When he was acting by, asked by a journalist, what does directing mean for him? Andre said, a good casting. Yes, yes, said the journalist, a good casting, but maybe something more. No, not really, said Andrzej Vajda. If you have a good actor, you have a good film. You have a bad actor, you have a bad film. Of course, of course, there is a certain truth in that. You can have an ingenious director, you have an ingenious uh, uh, script, but if you have bad actors, you, you get a shitty film, that's all. So, it was just an uh, anecdote. Now, coming back to our uh, example of a preface, how we should do our preface, so we're sitting in a, in a room and we're imagining where the water will be, uh, that there will be strong wind, etc., etc., but we do not show, show that. You know, that would be quite dry if you watch that, because we would, by, watch, by watching that, we'd lose the context. If we're doing that only for ourselves, not for any public uh, showing, we can steal as much as we can. I mean, it's not stealing, it's... Uh, Quoting, we can get from some great films which were made for huge bu budgets, we can uh, cut away est establishes or action scenes which were to resemble a see an action scene from our film, so that what we are doing only with actors uh, as master shots. 
in master shots and not really processing too much and not getting into too much detail and a lot of editing. If you add to that something that is a quotation from a number of well-known films, then by watching it, you still, you still, it will not be. Uh, uh, you would not show it outside, but it will you, it will give you a lot of information. One of the first informations is the time, the duration. <coughs> My example, as a, as a beginner, I made a, a feature film, and the first uh, editing version was four and a half hours. I had it edited already, uh, and I, you know, I was I was uh, doing it for a and a half hour film. I thought the longer the better because nobody would change the system in a in a cinema for a, and nobody would uh, get my, nobody would show my film. Every year I do workshops in film schools, and the first thing that I do during the workshops and and oh, sorry that the directors do during my workshops. They they always they always do long films. They say the, the longer the better. I say all right. But this way of thinking then, uh, the, this way of thinking will make them do what I had to do. I spent eight months in editing room, and my final film was actually cut short to such an extent that I could not recognize it. Why did I do such a long film? Because nobody in film school told me that, of course, I'm an artist and inspiration is important, but at the same time we're craftsmen and we have to be able to make, to make a film which is within this production window. Spielberg can, can afford to make a four-hour film, but not Kowalski or me. The control of time is a very important uh, tool which, help, which will help us a lot in, nam, the, which, in which Previs really helps us. Another thing which is which we also have to realize is that quite often our imagination about the film or our is are too vague and too general, especially when it comes to set design, for example. It's also related to the next uh, topic or the economic uh, risk control or financial film control, because that is that we're starting a film, we have a lot of money, and quite often this money is consumed by by set designers. Because if a set designer had maybe for a slightly too big design, the producer would say, all right, let it be. The problem is that set designers are people who, whose education has nothing to do with, uh, with the plot or with building the drama. This, usually uh, people, who, uh, the people who get there are graduates uh, of, from who, the graduates of art uh, faculties as well as uh, construction faculties and engineers. They build beautiful things uh, and there are set designers who uh, are really good even in, in uh, the things I, you would not expect them to have. But there are also those who just build whatever they see, but they cannot see the drama you know, behind that. Sometimes, you know, you, you just need one room and then they will build you a whole apartment. It's not just a view for which is required for the camera, but they, they want to create... The, I will tell you a, a good anecdote. It's quite drastic, but so maybe it's good to, uh, to tell it. There's nothing to draw, but I made a film called the King Arthur. It was a high-budget film, and uh, for this film, uh, the Hadrian Wall was to be built. Uh, England was divided uh, betwe between the part of the uh, Roman Empire and the pa pagan part. And, and this uh, the Hadrian Wall, which we were building, it was 1.2 kilometers. If I, yes, this is the Hadrian Wall. Of this, seven meters high and four meters thick. In, in the place of my head was a huge, uh, a huge gate. There was a fort which had about 10 buildings. And now, as I keep my hands like that, in front of me, in front of the Hadrian Wall, was a, was a hill. The hill, it was a famous Baden Hill, and the final battle took place between the, the wall and the Baden Hill. When I came to the set, this, this wall was already built. Well, not yet, but it was almost ready. Now look at this. The sun was rising here. 
it went like this and was setting there. For a month, we were shooting the, the action scene. And you do not need Arthur Reinhardt to ask one question, because is that um, um, action scene should be made in counter situations. So for a month, uh, set design, which was which costed $12 million, was behind us, of, behind our camera. Because it was because it was it was senseless to, to put a camera in the other way because you would not feel the action. But that was not the end. In one place, here, there was a forest. So I was setting my camera on the top to see all this. If I wanted to, to, to see this wall, uh, the forest covered half of this, half of this, uh, co the, the forest covered half of this wall, and we could build that all in CGI. So it was absolutely pointless and money totally lost. This was money thrown out of the window. You do, any student of a, of a primary school who photographs his uh, girlfriend would know that. If I want to, if I want to photograph a girl, uh, to show how, how long are her legs, I will be filming her from the, from, from the bottom and not from the top, obviously. That's why this hadron wall was looking, was, uh, looking like, a, uh, like a toy, you know? Only when you look at it from the bottom, it looks imposing. So this is this is the set design for you. Of course, it's not everybody who do things like that. I don't know if it was the the, uh, the fault of director or the set designer because the director was sitting in Los Angeles suburbs, and for the first time he sort of traveled to a different country. It's not about really whose fault is. It's a drastic situation of a phenomenon I was talking about. In case of Previs. We're building something more than a script. We're building something that tells us where we are. And here, let me move smoothly to, to the next topic. Um, it is a very significant, significant problem, in a way, and you really have to realize that when you start your own film, because you're crossing certain magical barrier. Uh, making student films and making professional films are two different worlds. The professional crew is uh, used to saying yes to everything you say. They are not your artistic partners. They are not people who are ready to stay with you in the evenings and do and brainstorm new ideas. They will always say yes, sir, to any of your stupid ideas. So uh, the director of a feature film, when he, his relations are based only on the uh, on an agreement and a short uh, talk in a coffee shop, you know, what the film should be about, uh, condemns himself to a loneliness. Um, of course, you have a script, uh, you have a script to, to, to communicate with your uh, the crew, but if you read a book, of course, everybody uh, has a different imagination about it, everybody has a different idea and perspective. You, uh, everybody imagines, if, if I read about a heroine or, the, or sorry, a female protagonist, everybody has in his mind his own archetype of a protagonist. If we're doing a feature film, we can always say that all our cooperators have a have a different interpretation from us. Moreover, the directors have this uh, feeling that uh, when they try to say why they make a film, it suddenly becomes too shallow. So instead of creating a, a set of, of building a team which thinks collectively and works collectively, they deal with something like that, that, that the director every day has to say everything to everyone. The process of directing is not an easy process. It's another thing that you should uh, bear in mind. And it's a dramatic problem. Even the biggest directors have this, make the same mistake. 
Let's take an example which is quite often seen is that the director is the scriptwriter at the same time. So he wrote a script and in the beginning of the script there was, there was a certain act of love. He fell in love in his own text, in, in, in this story and wrote it. But later when it, he wrote it, somebody criticized it, so he rewrote it. And later, with the script, uh, you know, the, the, the problem of getting the money starts. He, he starts running from one person to another and starts pitching how fantastic it is. Uh, just to convince all the cooperators and all the, fund, uh, all the donors that it's so great. <coughs> After two, three years, because only Jagoda Szelc uh, was lucky enough to, to have, have her film realized in the film school, which, so she's an exception to the rule. Uh, usually this process is exa exactly I told you about in the last uh, um, lecture, that first you have uh, film school, then you have a waiting room which, which devastates you, and then you've got fundraising, and, and it, it does not help debuts. So coming back to the situation of this lonely director who tries to raise this money, tries to convince everybody around him, the first shooting day is standing on a set, and what he, what he wants to uh, uh, realize now is not his first job, it's not his favorite wife, he's all, almost on the brink of divorce. He's not telling the on same story. He has it glued like it's, it's not funny for him. It's like an old re repeated joke. And when he tries to talk about it to the people, it's not funny too. Of course, nobody would tell him, but you can see that, that this shouting of young directors is caused by this great tension between what he has forced upon him and the fear that he has in his uh, uh, in his guts. It's a natural process. It's a devaluation of something that was emotion. We're, we're, in, a fact, we're in the industry of emotions. If there are no emotions, you will do nothing. And his emotions are dead already. You see what happens. It is quite often that, and it's common among directors, including the greatest names in the industry, at some point they mentally forget, they, they mentally lose What's, what was the, the, the engine, the drive for the story? The, and they're looking for something new. They look for some new energy, for attractive things. But this is not the way it works. We can use, we can use al only as many subplots as your main plot is important. It's only the plot which allows you to, uh, to tell the story, which tells the story. Of course, subplots are helpful. They support your message. But the number of subplots is dependent on the power of the plot. And that's the first thing which always falls on the floor, flat on the floor. Uh, now it, it used to be in the editing room, and now it's, it's deleted in a computer. Are the subplots? Do <coughs> so, coming back to the previs, we have a tool which helps you to control or refresh it uh, in a different way than a written text, this need to keep to the main story, because otherwise we would perish. Here is another example uh, that, uh, that it's worth to make a preface. Listen, it's, it's, much, a, it's much better financial document. It's much easier to calculate your cost based and the scale based on a preface. And, uh, you know, because you see it, if you're sh showing the interior of the, of the yacht, we can see the difference between the big yacht and the small yacht. Uh, you can see where your camera should be located. We, we can calculate special effects. After making such a previs on a yacht or in a raging sea, which is not a raging sea, you can much better imagine how much money we have to spend, where we have to uh, use gimbals, and here it's and in, in different places it's enough we get a shaky camera. We can also start to build a common denominator and co the same page with our uh, crew. So if we try to ask the, the composer to prepare some music or set designer to make some scene, it's enough for him to show us what, uh, what his ima imagination, where is his imagination is going. Uh, the, the composer might just give us a similar uh, piece to what he wanted to do. And the cameraman can make one of those 
scenes pokazać mi more realistic, so just to show the style of the film. So at the level of premise, jak ubieranie choinki, uh, it's a bit like you're, you're putting ornamentation on, the, on a Christmas tree. You get closer, to one, of the, one after the other, you get closer to what you should, to the message you want to convey in your film. If I don't know, don't understand the message, and the director does not tell me what is the message, why he wanted to make this story, and why he interprets it in that way, then I can't help him. And if I don't know the message of the film, I do not know the style of the film, because I do not, I cannot build the film. Ingmar Bergman, when he started his productions, he was writing a letter to his uh, crew. Of course, I will not give you all the details of, of a film, but I remember a letter which he wrote to, to his crew uh, when he was uh, working on Cries and Whispers, in which he wrote, Dear friends, the time has come to make another film, and this time I would like to make a film about women. I know, yes, I know. Yeah, you're all smirking because I'm only making films about women. But this time, I would like to make a film about the soul of a woman. But, and you know why? Because I believe that the soul of a woman is the most unexpected thing in the world. Unpredictable way, the thing in the world. And I, I imagine the soul of a woman in all shades of red. These have to be different colors, hues of red. Of red. There will be a whole plethora of uh, red tones. And th this, of course, inspired me for the, for the poster for this year's Film Spring Open. So here we have an example of something which is a document which unifies um, uh, people, you know. The cinematographer, everybody knows. You know, four, four sentences with one letter, in one letter. Of course, it, this, kind, this, this may be more. I don't know what's the message behind the silence of the lambs, but I, I'm sure it was about metamorphosis. Because we've got a girl who's from a... She's like a rural girl, and she's being transformed into a fantastic... FBI officer. We've got a murderer who, loved, who would like to be a woman, and that's why he kills women and dresses in their skin. And due to this fact, the director, without any reason, well, of course there is some reason, but to be honest, there are establishings in the films where you can see when larvae larva are changing into, larvae is changing into a moth. So all this film is circling around one motive. All the crew, everybody knows where they are going. When you're doing a previs, you're not just sitting in a, co uh, in a coffee shop and talking or, or a cafe and talking. Uh, we can... Product we can show where we want to lead our uh, product. Okay. Product placements. If somebody reads the script, they say, okay, well, let's say a, a guy who works at Coca-Cola, a PR manager, he will, will he be reading your scripts? Uh, if, he reads, if, he, if you write that uh, a star... A star actor will drink Coca-Cola, maybe that would get him interested. But for, uh, for, such, for a layman, it would be much easier to get him interested. And uh, it's also uh, easier when you do a preface to judge the proportions between the main plot and subplots. Of course, it's also difficult to assess very minutely. It's, you can, of course, um, sort of set proportions between CGI and life. But these are all details. The most important part is what I believe, and it more uh, relates to this financial uh, risk management, is the situation concerning, and I'm, I was talking about that in my last le lecture, is the need to get editing on the go. I can give you just a few examples. The closest example is Jagoda Schelz. Which, which was talking all the time how she was editing on the set and how important uh, is that about the alchemy of editing and about everything that the, ed the editing allowed her to do. She did not use, a, uh, she didn't say 
Previs, she didn't use this word, but she was talking about the months of rehearsals and filming those rehearsals. Tomek Vasilevsky was here three years ago, who made a film in 12 shooting days, and he had 70,000 zlotys for this film, which is Mickey Mouse money. And he did it only because for half a year, he made, he was rehearsing the scenes and he got prepared. So in different systems, there are very different things of preparation for the films. Let's say Anglo-Saxon films never start with shooting. So when you're making a, a film, uh, you never start a film with shooting days. So you, you usually get the reading first, the reading days first. We do not have anything like that in Europe and that is stupid because that might be a very, very a small form of, of prevision, but quite often it has a huge impact because uh, during those reading days, script reading days, uh, there is a script. Uh, the script writer is present, and then he always introduces changes. The most important role of the previs which is the, is the role tego, co uh, consisting in the proper Proszę assessment of, on, of what we've done. Experienced talent, directors have a certain talent arising from lat, the, the years they spent on the set. Of a certain, they had a certain autopilot of assessment of individual elements. Głowy, Somewhere in, wiedzą, at the back of their head, there is, you know, they know that uh, uh, being crazy about one scene Natomiast is stupid. Reżyser, but a young director Ocenia, assess, even if planie, the scene is edited scenę, on the set, he assesses uh, a scene as a, as a lonely island. But the scene is no, never a lonely trwania. island. At the, ti the time of the scene, its functioning is dependent on the, scenie, the, on the scenes which are around it and the whole form of narration. If you have a previs made, uh, well, a decent previs in the beginning process, of your process uh, of uh, filming, previs, in the beginning of your process uh, of uh, filming, then you're not, you will not be watching one scene, but you will be getting out of premises the scenes which are which you do not, do not like, and you will get in, uh, or you will get a rough cut out of the premise, and you will, and you will get in at a clean scene. I remember I was working in a German system, and I liked it quite a lot. That on weekends we had shows, uh, we, we were we had screenings of the things that were already uh, stitched together. I've never seen that anywhere else, but. And I think that it was a great idea that on weekends, uh, after the after the lunch, we had uh, the screening of, uh, of scenes which were stitched together. So it, it gave everybody the same page of what we are working on. You know, Kieślowski did not die because uh, Kieślowski was so great because he knew that the, the real work of art has its own life. What you have in your heads is, has nothing to do with getting, with being created in front of your eyes. I told you that during my last lecture. And our role is, of course, to to keep to a certain protocol or minutes of the script. But the script will, will certainly be changed. It will be amended. Maybe not like in uh, the blue of Kieslowski, but to maybe to a, such an extent uh, like in a film I did with Vida, where the script was, was uh, uh, from the point of view of the, of the conductor, and after a few or three uh, and after a few uh, rehearsals, it occurred that the film is about Christina Yanda. So having the script and keeping to the script, you should look at it so that the, uh, after a few rehearsals, we found out that everything is more revolving around the female Actually, so this, our favorite baby is growing in a different way that we have uh, foreseen. Urodziła się dziewczynka. Let's to jest bzdura baby, wychować dziewczynkę uh, chłopczyka. A tak z filmem jest. Boy, but you have a girl. Tak z filmem so jest. So it would be stupid to raise your girl as a boy. But this is what, how the film Kieślowski works. Po zdjęcia po 12 godzinach chodził up, do montażowni i po 3-4 godziny uh, siedział w montażowni, czy nie spał w ogóle. A ponieważ był film za filmem, to, to jego uh, serce powiedział bye bye. Or four hours a my tak nie było takich narzędzi. Nie uh, so he was not sleeping at all. So after a few films, his heart did not manage it. Bo montażyści też nie lubią być na planie, bo to jest burdel, bo jest hałas i tak dalej. Uh, editing is also difficult. Uh, uh, 
Editing is also difficult on the set because uh, the uh, editors do not like to be present on the set because you know it's messy, it's uh, it's loud, Montage and editing is the base. However, to control where we are, those who are not editing on the go, there is in our times there is a big chance that the, the catastrophe will be even bigger. But if it's going to be a disaster, it will be a disaster anyway. But to a certain extent, you will be able to say this room anyway. But uh, editing on the go will allow you to get so, to sober up at the right moment. And now I would like to refer once again to the uh, lecture of Jagoda Szelc. She said uh, during the lecture that at some point, due to financial reasons, she had to freeze her set. And it was like a real drama, but because of this break I grew up. This is what she said. An anecdote. I was a member of a jury um, a few, good few years ago, uh, and, the, and the film, and the film uh, Prengi won, and the, it, it got the main award, and Koszałka, who was doing the, the cinematography, also got an award. Uh, the director invited me, uh, invited me for a coffee, and she told me how, how she made this film. She said that there was a big drama during the creation of this film, be, the, is that the producer, yeah, Mr. Zanossi, uh, sort of froze the budget and she was suicidal because she thought she would never finish this film. But due to the lack of any possibility of doing something else in order to, to, to uh, calm herself, she was moving around the scenes in the editing room and suddenly she realized that what she's doing it's stupid. When the money appeared, she started to do a different film. You all read the story of Ida. Ida is exactly the same situation. The director says in every interview, this film was saved by the God. Uh, the weather was bad, I had to stop filming, and during that time I realized that I'm going the wrong way. I rewrote my script, then I got the Oscar. I remember also that Woody Allen did all films, did films always like that. He, first he, he was filming for two weeks, then he sent everybody home, he was rewriting the script. Although, um, when I look at his last films, he, I believe he should come back to his, uh, to his method, because his last films were are much worse than what, one he, what he did in previous times, they were much better. But when we're talking about risk management, especially concerning young, women, uh, young uh, people, we are not planning such uh, breaks. Why are we not doing that? This is not no money at all. Uh, we tell everybody that after, after two weeks, we are sending everybody home, we are giving back the rented equipment, we don't pay for anything. That should be planned. Why aren't we doing that? For a very simple reason, because the philosophy of making films is that in the shortest possible time, you should, the director should have enough resources in the shortest possible time. You should, uh, uh, the director should have enough resources within the existing budget. budget. So the effect is such that the pragmatism is the rule, the, the money rule. The person who came up with that does not really care about the quality of the film. And additionally, in Europe, the whole revenue of the producer is one filming day. So in, in Europe, if you want to convince the producer to make one additional uh, filming day, uh, you are stealing his money. And I did not do a single American movie without, uh, in which you would not have additional filming days. Not a single one. And in a stupid film like King Arthur, it was a silly film, we had three times additional uh, filming. A week, then three days, and then once again three weeks to redo the whole ending of the film. The difference? Of course, it's a huge difference. Because those three, four days sometimes make all the difference. And I will give you a Polish example once again. Uh, the salon of suic the suicidal salon, uh, also due to the goodwill of the producer, Komasa was the director. He, he redid the whole ending. And that's the best part of the film. This is what really uh, you know, put, makes us drop to our knees. It's a totally new thing. And it was never in the original script. 
Dlaczego my nie mamy czegoś takiego? Why aren't we doing as why hmm. aren't we working in a system like that? Nie I don't know. Mieć. We could my have razie, it. Razie, robić film w autobusie, When we'll be doing in a, a film in a cinebus, we want to um, uh, we, ha- we want to have a planned break in filming days. No dobrze, i teraz przejdę szybko. All right, let me move on now to um, the financial part of the risk of the risk control. I told many things during my last uh, lecture. No, Cooper, na oh, I sobie. think I omitted plenty of things, but we didn't have the time. No, może zacznę od tego, że Let me start with the fact Masilewski. that uh, uh, Wasilewski, whom I mentioned here, presented a film called Sypialni. Uh, in Bedroom. I na tym samym tutaj, na tych samych plenerach and, and in the same, uh, w, in the same sets we are sh- sh- showing uh, Miłosz Fabickiego, the love of Fabicki. They were very similar in terms of budget, the, the same, um, uh, uh, sorry, the, the same interiors, the, the same cost of actors, one of, the, one, one, one of them was made for private money, 70,000 Polish lotis, the other one was 3 million for uh, 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 official funds. Even if the film of Wasilewski, which was, uh, uh, you know, underfunded because he didn't pay anybody, even if he paid everybody, even if the film was costing million, I, I think it didn't have to cost million. Just as he said, it would be less than a million zlotys. So you can see the difference between three million and one million. And once again, let me let me come back to what I said in the last uh, lecture. There is certain money given to debits because there is no political will to change that. So all we can do we, we to make is to make it cheaper, and we should not spend throw this money out of the window in a wrong in a bad production system. This money is being lost somewhere on the way. And here I'm also, I'm also showing you my colleagues Dorota and Arthur who would, they would never make films they are doing were it not for the fact that some time ago, some time ago they, they made their own production company and they are deciding about the spending themselves and they're spending the money in unconventional ways. They are not s- spending Um, any money without purpose, but thanks to that they get great results. If Arthur and Dorota did not build their own private company some time ago and were they not working together, they would never manage to pull it off. Now we have to come back to a certain paradigm, which in my view is idiotic. We are working in a director-based system, in a PR, you know, from the point of view of reception, it makes a, it makes this illusion that the director is the conductor over the orchestra. Of course, the director leads the way, and but in different system, it works in different way. In, in for example. In America, the producer is the conductor. And here I will... Quite often, it is toler- it is, the director is only tolerated on the set not to, uh, not to offend him, and there is a guest director, and he makes, he makes all the decisions. And the director is in a horrible uh, mental situation because he has nothing to do with the set. I, I experienced that twice on the set of American films. Um, and the studio can destroy a film too. They can they can dis- uh, turn the film topsy turvy just because the director is weak. We are working in this uh, uh, director-based system, not really realizing that it finished a long time ago. The career of Roman Polanski will not be repeated. The, the times are different. We're on the brink of of group or teamwork. We're not. Uh, in the times of individuality anymore. Computer video games, uh, TV series, uh, interactive format. This is what is before us. It's impossible for one director to do that because it's it's a past, it's a long gun. Because the model of a career which is being uh, followed in um, in by the film schools is a silly uh, model because it arises from a tradition and history just because at some point making films was a difficult technological un- um, enterprise and you had hun- you needed hundreds of people because for every lamp you needed one person who was only looking at those two cells because this uh, the distance between the cells in the lighting uh, you had more or less uh, light and the dolly was 11 tons 
so we have huge people are sorry, one point five uh, tons. So, so when you have an army, you need a general, you need a guy who makes order. But now you can make films in five, six people team, and you can compare it with uh, music making. There's a difference between a symphonic orchestra where you need a conductor. But if we're doing a chamber orchestra, you don't need any uh, uh, conductor whatsoever. There might be an individuality there, which is sort of a leader of the team. And it's always like that when the teams fall apart, we know who is the individuality. But the difference is consists in that you don't, you're not working on the ego of one person, you create a certain team, and the team, for team, it's automatically easier to break through, starting from the example of Arthur and Dorota, who are sitting in the front row, because they are um, a scriptwriter and director team, but at the same time they are producers, so they, are, uh, they have many hats on. So let's say in a film school you have a team of four people, it will be automatically easier for them to break through and get something real in the world. The difference is so such that if you get four musicians together, they get together and they play music together. And when you get four films, Together, they start with the quarreling who is the more important one. I, I visit, uh, I visit your school, I meet Katyn for the first time, I don't know anybody, and I know exactly who will be the future director, who will be the future cinematographer and future editor, because the future edi editors did not achieve anything, but the gestures are already you know, huge, and uh, they already um, nurture their creative egos. Jagoda Szelc was always talking about her films, and here we had a number of young directors, and all they said, they said, I. I did that, I came up with that. So next time when they come to this cinematographer uh, who was working with her, he will show them this. It's the team who does the film, not the director. And you have to respect that. And you can work from the very beginning in the team system. This is the future of our industry. Team is always stronger. If we're talking about risk management, if we are saying that a young director, especially a beginner uh, director, is totally lonely, then the teamwork is necessary. Listen, I know a, a large portion of you. I don't know a few of you, but I know that in front of me, I have only egoists, only egoists sitting in front of me. That, is that true, Arthur? Film is not a place for, place for altruists. It's not a nursing school. Here you've got egoists only. And this is the condition for creation. Without a huge ego, there is no creativity. But I must tell you clearly that great artists can, can find a place for the ego of other people. Just like Vaida, who was sleeping, somebody did things for him, and he said, wow, that's interesting, okay, go, move on, go on, go on. It's always the Vaida's film, but somebody else did that. He added his brick to this, to this structure of the film. Uh, middle, uh, the the sculpt, sculptors of Middle Ages, when they were sculp sculpting the uh, medieval churches, the Gothic churches, they were making fantastic things that nobody would see. The, the, the birds are shitting on those sculptures now. But they were creators. They did that for the God, and we do it for the art. If you have a team, the, when this team will go break through, the whole people, will, the whole world will know you, just like the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, and the more contemporary ones. So it's worth to try to work in a team. I told you about the, the uh, economic uh, uh, aspects of the micro-budget uh, uh, during my last lecture. Just like in, uh, just like in the London, in the microwave uh, um, based their uh, financial structure on uh, voluntary work with later royalties for the film. But of course, this also requires some like legal, uh, legalistic experience. Okay, let's start from the syllabus, which is standing next to here. We're, we're 
when we're talking about professions. I'm observing what's happening around our cinemas. We went to a few places now and uh, we did a few films. We never did a feature film yet, but uh, we did a, f a certain educational films already. And there's a very characteristic thing with people who, who work there. You know, they're young people and I clearly see two types of collaborators. Those who work from A to B, I will not give you um, spe specialties or professions because it's, it's not important. I, I'm, a, I'm this and this and I will not do that and that. And those people who treat that as a, well, it's good to be together and shouldn't, why shouldn't I help or clean up after someone or, or get something in or out. The curse of the, mod of, of the current model of production is I'm just from A to B. Of course, there's no problem in us if, if we made a feature film with, in cinemas to have uh, to employ two or three uh, people on duty who would be just cleaning things or serve, you know. But automatically, I must assure you, the relations at work will get, will get worse. It will become cramped. People, after moving something, will have nothing to do. They will be talking aloud and they will be laughing and they will be getting in the way of the specialists who will be working on their individual work, CGI, c color correction and other things. Those things, in a systemic way, should be extended from the very beginning and show clearly how we are still in one with one way like we're still in the analog world and let's go through all those uh, professions because it's quite interesting how it how, what it, how it looks like in individual professions let me start from what I mentioned the the on duty and uh, guys and electricians I worked in Mexico, where, to my astonishment and then uh, satisfaction, I had only one team of electricians and grips. And they were uh, Native Americans who worked with me. Mm. Okay. So when you were working in, uh, indoors, the on-duty guys were helping with the cables, and if there was no lighting, the electricians <coughs> helped with, you know, getting uh, all equipment in order. I have this do, do uh, professional groups and their workload is absolutely incomparable. Uh, I will give you an anecdote. Uh, anecdote. I, was, I was filming on the top of one of the New York buildings. It was quite a difficult shooting because I had to have a... Uh, I had to do um, a storm with lightning, so we had to get a lot of equipment and additional lamps on other buildings. We, we had the first model of technical uh, crane, we had this uh, some very heavy equipment to get on the top of, top of the building, and suddenly I realized that the, that the light uh, on the neighboring rooftop that it does not uh, shine exactly as I wanted. And I sent an electrician to go there and change it. So he got on the lift, he went 30, uh, uh, 30 levels down, then he went up and he started to sort of work with the slide. And suddenly I realized that I, it was stupid what I told him because it was enough to move the flag. Why should we move the lamp itself? And I told him, just, just leave this lamp alone by through walkie-talkie. I'm not shutting him. Just just move the flag and he says that's a great idea but it's not my department because in america he has no right to touch the flag this is the work of the grip and he didn't touch it is it absurd yes it is in addition in different countries it works in a different way nobody follows that listen we are producing always the same the, the film better or worse but the way it's, it's made it's different in every country i was filming in uh, 14 countries and i was i'm always surprised by something and nobody really realizes that nobody thinks about that that certain uh, ideas are good and certain are horrible Let's start with the cinematographer. What's the workflow of the cinematographer? Well, it's very simple. I'm the uh, guy who 
gives idea of the lighting and the general conduction uh, and, and general concept oh, and this set designer suddenly uh, he's, he's, he's preparing uh, the interiors we get a lot of the furniture inside and we're, when we're fi finishing the shooting uh, we move to the next location and what happens then the location is ready from the uh, from the point of view of design but there's no lighting so I need to light it so I need to start with one or one and a half hour of setting the lighting. I really do not understand with the technology that we have. Why can't we think that if we are making a film which is in natural settings, sometimes it's the, all you need to do is to, 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 to move the furniture or paint the wall. Why can't we forget about this system and go in the direction which I called towards which I call visual director. Why is there no visual director who would be responsible for the whole visual part of the film? Because the cinematographer in the current system, in the comparison to the, to the uh, cinematographer from my past, uh, what he makes is just a semi-ready product. What I was looking on at the, uh, on the raw film then was seen by the people in the, in the cinema. What I'm doing now on the raw film is just a semi-product and then it's remade, it's edited and edited. Uh, in the past we could change the color on a linear, uh, in a linear way. Right now we can give any color we wish. I had uh, huge suitcases with hundreds of filters to change the filming. Right now everything is done in post-production. So, you can see already one thing which would be very easy to change, because if we had a visual director, he should have certain rights to control the whole visual part of the film. He should be the, the person, or they should be the person, that makes certain selections but uh, and choices, but is also responsible for the preparation of light. So in a way, I would imagine that this uh, assistant cinematographer who's, who's uh, helping with the camera and the guy who's preparing the next, uh, the next uh, um, set, uh, the next location, uh, that could work. Okay. This this also works in Poland. I mean, if you, uh, Wojciech Staron, whose film was shown yesterday, no, sorry, not yesterday. No, no, no. I I'm talking about the film about the the, Ro the, the Romani people, the legend about something I don't remember the name. Papusha. Oh, Papusha. Papusha was made uh, by Wojciech Staron and Krzysztof Ptaszek. Uh, uh, he was a great man. He made it together uh, as two cinematographers. There was a different selection, different division of roles, but this is not important uh, in this case. But this form of visual, of, of visual person who's res responsible for the whole visual side of the film, and it's absolutely, it's, it's absolutely attainable. And the current state of technology, technology allows that. Right now, the technology allows us to uh, the people in post production to do whatever they want. I can. And make, it, make a green film and they can make a red film out of it. I'm sitting in the, on a set of a great, uh, in an editing room of an of a, of a American blockbuster. Uh, I can hear, I can, and I can tell to the editor, to uh, green! I can tell to the editor that it should be a, a bit more green, and the wife of the producer says, it's too green, and he repeats, it's too green. So, you know, this is how it works. It's an example which shows us that you can save a lot of money, but also make it quicker to work, to get the work done quicker. Natalie Portman did not come to Poland just because she fell in love in, with me or film Spring Open, but because we helped her to make her debut film. And, uh, so that she was ready uh, before the, the last day of shooting. It was. Ne it never happened before that the that in a debuting uh, with a debuting director you save days of shooting. And this is what really happened there. And the, and the idea was very simple. I made this sort of sort of second crew. Uh, there was an additional cinematographer who was either doing if if we needed more cameras, he was working with us. But his main 
role consisted, and that's very often uh, in case of debuting film, in case of a certain discipline of, of uh, filming. Quite often there is a system when we are doing one scene before the dinner and uh, before the lunch and one after the, work, the lunch, and I can tell you assuredly that you will you will not be if you will not be able to do the scene before the lunch and you will postpone it after the lunch, you will not start the next scene, only you will make just a ten or one shot of the next scene, and you're already um, late. I told Natalie to plan the shooting for each scene so that uh, uh, the shots without her, with other actors, were were filmed at the end. So that you know, so that if we could not, if we were late because we would go. You know, she went through all the films. She was playing. Uh, she was cast in the main, ro main role. We could go from scene to another, and the other cinematographer. Uh, who did a lot of uh, additional work. Uh, we, we were moving from one location to another in the same building. And the, the additional cinematographer, he was doing additional scenes and doubles. So we never lost, we didn't lose a single hour from our filming days. And quite often it is so that you lose half a day here, half a day there, and then you get into trouble. Additionally, there is also a certain misunderstanding, uh, and I return to what Jagoda Szczert said, Remember that this system of the second director in Poland and in the world is totally different. It is. Because the first director assistant is not really the assistant of a director in the American. It's, it's a production guy. He gets paid, he gets a bonus to make the film faster. He's the, econ he's, he's the, economic, ec he's the economist and he's the, he's the guy who are always responsible to make to, to, for, to get the, the schedule right. Are they thinking about the, uh, the value of the film? Not really. What they really uh, mean to have done is to follow the schedule. Quite often we have a lot of time for subplots, but for the real plot the, the time is, there, there's not really much time. And I remember when I made the film in Ireland, the director for the, I went to Ireland and the set was prepared and the director it was her first film and the, the assistant did not give her, give her a chance to make a good film because in the most difficult scenes he did not understand there, there is a difference in time when you're making a night filming and you, need, you really need to devote some time to pre preparing the lighting. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, uh, you, we had to film on the run and he really destroyed the film by his filming schedule. So never, never give up. Do not, do not give them the chance to change your plan. That's why they have their production. Uh, just like Dorota, you know, Dorota never allows anyone to prepare the, the filming schedule. She does it by herself. Uh, so the sound engineer. The sound engineers are a problem because they have... Um, we do not have, we never have enough of them. Whenever you go to any school, or the, and if you're looking for a cinematographer, you will get a handful of people who would want to work for you for free. But you never get a sound engineer who will work for you for free, because there's only one school in Poland, I think there's one more in Poznań now, which educates uh, sound engineers. So they are a bit spoiled by their working condition, by the market, but they also treat this, uh, they have two technological approach or technical approach to this to this uh, uh, profession. So they just record the sound and they don't care about anything else. So this distribution of responsibility, we have a cinematographer who's, uh, who records uh, Sorry, we have a sound engineer who, who records uh, um, sound on the set and then it moves to post-production and editing. If he's ambitious, he can get some additional effects who, which can help a lot in a scene. Uh, is there, do you think there's anybody who's in post-production who's, who's looking into that? They don't care. They get sounds from stock. That's why in your films, especially the cheaper uh, films, all those sound effects are exactly the same because it's always the same file. It's exactly the same shot. It's a, a, exactly the same siren and what's really funny in polish films the 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 ambulances 
uh, have the sound of American ambulances. Czyli We know that it's an it's absurd. E We know what the sound of ambulance is in Poland. So all this organi organization-wise, uh, he should be in included in the production much earlier. I remember sound engineers from a diff from different times who were also doing the editing, and they really incredibly used the sound effects that they were recording because they knew what they have on the on the tapes and on the recording. So it was not uh, treated uh, like nothing. And these are systemic problems. Not to mention that each time there's always the same story. The actors get on the set, and the sound engineer, especially if she's a if if she's a nice girl. Sorry. She starts to, you know, the, uh, sorry, the sound engineer starts to put the microphone under the, the, the brow of, of a nice girl um, and it takes for ages. Why aren't they, pre the, the sound is not prepared uh, before? Why, do, why, why, why suddenly this guy uh, wakes up and says, oh, sorry, but this, this uh, textile is uh, making noise, I can't record anything. Uh, he should have known that from the start. Uh, you, you know, this always loses, you know, wastes time, and this is a systemic problem which can be forced by the director. There's no prob no problem with getting the microphone set up before the uh, the filming starts. If we take all those minutes uh, of preparation, uh, it, you all, you, during the day you have half a day of preparation. Uh, which is wasted, and every day is of real value for the for the beginners. Producers, well, uh, composition costumes in a modern film, come on, remember, just, if you go through all those tables that are that are provided by PISF and other any other institutes like uh, in Germany and other things, they are all copied from American templates. But th this is idiotic; it's totally different. If we if we've got a modern film where two brothers are playing, uh, uh, when you have a costume designer, uh, uh, he, he would go to a flat of one of the, those guys and he would say, okay, today you will play in those jeans and tomorrow in that jeans. And he gets money for that. He does nothing. This is the end of his role. Then we've got the, uh, the set designer and who also does nothing. I'm quite intrigued sometimes by people who work on the set. Oh, set secretary, look at the table. They do everything that was that was necessary in the past. When all those shots were put on the shelves and you had to have everything described, nobody reads that. Additionally, uh, when you really need what she writes, for example, for CGI, you get some really detailed measurements of uh, of camera angles, etc. A guy comes, like a vi visual effects guy comes and does it all by himself because he doesn't trust the, the set secretary. So the role of the set secretary sh should be dramatically changed. They were necessary at some point in order to think about continuity. Uh, Evermore will be shooting a multi -cameras in multi-camera system and the continuity is not important anymore. It is in a way important because you need to know where the where, where you end one scene and when where the other scene starts. So it's not to be totally cast away or rejected, but, but the amount of forms and papers that, that has to be filled is incredible and it's absolutely outdated. The producer. So if you look, if you if you learned the profession, uh, craftsman in the in the, in the past, in order to be, become the master, you had to travel. You had to go to uh, to other cities, other countries. You had to see how other people worked, uh, and you had to practice there. You had to become an apprentice there. Just, of course, they, they also guarded their their own uh, the trade secrets. But in whole Europe, the fact of 
traveling traveling interns because they had to be uh, it was accepted uh, apprentices you know it was accepted that an apprentice could not become a master if he did not travel and work in a different place in a different country in a different city look at our Look, look at producers in our country and in local every other country. It's it's a local job. When you're lo when you're when you have a local job, you think locally. They do not learn what could be because they can't do it, and the, the schools do not react because they they teach you in a closed circuit of thinking. This lecture in a slightly different form or in a more technical form uh, was delivered last time, and. And I was I was giving this lecture in a production department in one of the film schools, and I'm asking the teacher. Yeah, I'm a teacher, and I'm uh, I'm and there were no questions. Nobody said a word. I left, and that was it. Nobody will change it because that would break certain group interest. There is said, you know, people are used to it, you know, the status quo is okay, until it falls uh, apart, it's going to work. But this applies to you, and this is the money which are for you, and th this money is wasted. And this, your future is being realized by a system which is uh, dysfunctional. With not ag exaggerating too much, the I could say that the system is built against the newcomers. In Poland, the films which get piece of money, I don't know how it's going to be this year, maybe about two years, there were about 30 films. I follow the statistics. And the film schools which educate uh, filmmakers, there are 15 of them. So you get a lot of filmmakers being educated, taking into account that uh, among those 30 granted projects which got grants, the majority of the grants go to well-known uh, directors, you can easily calculate that for debuts there is almost no money at all. But nobody will get that for you, because nobody is interested apart from you. Nobody waits for you, as I told you in the beginning of my lecture. There are too many artists, too many films, and by this and through, uh, in order to get to this uh, very exclusive group, you need to fight, you need to uh, struggle, but there's also a, que a huge question mark. To, uh, you, should, you should really think about what people try to convince you, because people tell you that black is white, and my uh, statement is that black is not white. And thank you very much for your uh, attention. Any questions? Yeah. But you need to have the microphone because it's uh, translated. Do you have any microphone up there? First of all, thank you for your fantastic lecture. I was not here from the beginning. Uh, I was in the editing room when it was streamed. I, I used to say that uh, I had a hangover. I have a hangover. Well, it was you. Uh, I have a question. If you personally or Film Spring over Open will also take part in the plans uh, to support or create programs that would allow young filmmakers to, to do this apprentice travel? Well, the, my answer is yes. Thank you very much for this question. The syllabus, this, this is the result of what I said a moment ago. I suddenly realized, this is also ex an example of my lecture in the film school, there's no reaction. At some point, I came to the conclusion, uh, I was working with Natalia Por Natalie Portman, and we were going from the Jerusalem to Tel Aviv, and and I was talking to Wukash Baka, who did that film with me, because we tried to, to introduce this idea of cinebus. I came to the conclusion that this, these attempts of getting the 
the, the resources are stupid because nobody will give us money for a cinebus. And then we, we remodeled that uh, so that it's an ed educational and production uh, bus. So we've built a tool which is to educate, uh, which, which we, it's ready for production and it's ready for education. Why do I thank you for this question? Did I thank you for this question? Because it's already working. At any moment, we're ready to do a feature film. But the thing that I'm really looking for right now, is the need to build a team of people who would accept a different who would accept different conditions of cooperation these cannot be cooperators who just work from a to b because automatically the conditions of work in such a such as on such a small area would become very hard that would we our assumption is that films should be made by people uh, we should pay very well to the people who are very good and we should pay them more than than in other places but we should also ask them that it's not work from a to b okay you're a sound engineer but somebody has to move the cables or move the chairs get them out and put them around or help with uh, with putting up the tents you should help them because if nobody does that uh, there will be somebody of course who, who we could pay or but immediately we are drifting into the reality which is a, I would say have done I have this feeling that uh, teamwork only then really works when everybody in the team have the feeling that, that they are not obsolete at every American set, there are people who... Uh, it's just an anecdote. Let, just, let me give you an anecdote. I've, I, see, I see people on the film set, and I don't know what they're doing there. I, let me tell you a story. I made a film in Ireland, and they have the Anglo-Saxon Anglo towers. Uh, they have the towers which are like seven meters high. And these Anglo-Saxon towers uh, are being made in half an hour. In Germany, uh, they have towers which are exactly the same height, much lighter. Uh, it has no steel elements, and it's being uh, made. Uh, it's being assembled in uh, ten minutes. If somebody's good, you know. And from the point of view, I, I, you know, I ordered this team, and I suddenly see this guy who's. Uh, I see this guy whom I see every day and suddenly she cries, no, I do not allow, he's responsible for the safety on the set and this, uh, this tower has no certificate and we had to send it away. Of course, I've seen many situations on the set. Uh, I will not be criticizing such people because we quite often we are prone to risking the life of other peoples on the set and I re really people die on the set and I really uh, would like to warn you, like recently, there was a guy who who was um, uh, maimed on the set of Polish film by a gun, uh, which had no certification, and there was it was shot by a guy who had no certification to shoot it, because instead of of uh, because of special effects technician, they employed a guy who was a sp special service officer who's trained to kill, and in and and instead of and instead of shooting blanks, he put in a a real bullet and he maimed an, a cinematographer. Thankfully, he did not kill them, but he maimed him for life. So I, I, I plead you that uh, I, I remember how many people died on my sets, so please, please, do not be uh, uh, always be very careful about human life. So on a set I worked on for in, a, in an American film, they were to, to, to have an old truck. So instead of buying a new truck and making it look old, they uh, ordered uh, they, they bought a cheap old truck which had no brakes, and uh, it fell into the raven. And the guy who who had two weeks to his uh, wedding, he got he died there. You know, he got killed. It was it costed one hundred. 
the, the, the film was uh, costing 100 million uh, dollars and uh, still the safety was not secured. So I'm the last person who would risk anything. That Sometimes you get a really silly, uh, some f really freak accidents. Uh, I was I was in a in a filming set in Poland in the north of Poland. There was a guy who was to shake a girl, but but instead of just shaking her, he when he he, he let her go and he fell down and he hit uh, a stone with the back of her head and she momentarily. She would, she fell into, into a coma, and we believe she died. Uh, you know that she, she, the uh, the stone hit the connection between the skull and and the uh, and the uh, uh, and the spine. And thankfully, she she lived, but we didn't have the actress for quite a long time. As they say, in, as they say in the English language, shit happens, and you always have to remember about that. Do you have any questions? Thank you very much for this lecture. And I will also comment and ask also. My commentary is you said you talk about that from your perspective with the great experience. And I am a young filmmaker. But be just because I had a very small budget and because I had only two filming days, I exactly had to follow the way. Uh, you did. I, I didn't know the word privacy and risk management, uh, but I think many young people make films like that. They really uh, have a lot of respect for teamwork. These were not my, the people I worked with uh, were not my friends. They they were just people who wanted to work with me because they liked my idea. With each of them, I went through the script. But the biggest, and this is my commentary. The biggest, uh, I was most impressed by the editor who saved one of my scenes. Uh, we we uh, we edited this film in our head before the uh, film, and because of his comments, when I was already thinking how to get things together, how to edit the whole film, before. Uh, before uh, we started filming, we got rid of a, of a scene which was, and it all helped us with getting the whole film run. So, this prefacing and talking about the film before it and rehearsing the film is really, really important, and it really works even in very small productions just like mine. Absolutely. It's very interesting what you say, because first thing I wanted to say one thing which you should remember I'm doing workshops which take a week. And one, the first day is always the analysis of a script and uh, talking about the message and the style of the film. On the third day, people forgot about it, forget about it, and they, you know, they do something totally else. It's not just the question of talking to people; it's to get them infected with the idea so that they keep to this idea. It's, you, you cannot have horses pulling in different ways. What you're talking about is a very interesting phenomenon. It's good to think about it. It, it, it uh, also relates to something very different, but quite often, uh, and you, we know that also from uh, literature on creativity, especially uh, with writers, it is so that all artists have a certain artistic block. They do not ha know how to move on. And the answer is always, kill your beloved baby or kill the thing that you care most about even not knowing uh, even not knowing about that uh, I already observed that in Krzysztof Kieślowski's films when he was editing a film if something did not work he was deleting the best scenes which which made us furious because I believed that I, I filmed something which was absolutely great but of course not always all those scenes were deleted but the, this, de this deletion allowed him to sort of move away from the template he has in his head. He got away from the slavery to a certain idea or a certain text. Thanks to that, he could uh, reinterpret his whole film. And in many cases, it works pretty well. If you look, if you watched the, the making of, of Gladiator, there is an absolutely incredible scene of execution. 
it, well, it's, it's really shocking. But, and it's not in a film. And the journalist asks uh, Ridley Scott, where did you use this scene? It's n- it was not in my story. <laughs> That's the, the proof of class of great uh, directors. They say it's one story uh, and not another story. It's not like a Christmas tree where you have all sorts of, uh, of uh, elements. They are ready to sacrifice everything which does not relate to the main story they want to tell. Using the occasion, I will tell you something. I didn't, at some point, I didn't want to do, uh, I didn't want to make any films anymore, but, uh, and I did this film with Natalie Portman, Portman after I decided not to make films anymore, and I got a script for her, from her. It was a very, uh, very juvenile, in a way, um, script, which was only flashbacks and flash forwards. Of course, I have no right uh, and I don't want to impact on the set, uh, uh, to impact the director on the set, because it's, this is not my right, uh, this is not my role. I like to keep uh, to what I'm doing on the set. I, I, I am there to fulfill her requests, not the other way around. It would be horrible if I took over her role. Um, <laughs> Anyway, I did only one thing, and I said, Natalie, this is interesting, the form of narration that you use, but I I just want to warn you that you never know how you're going to, uh, you, where you're going to cut the time, how you're going to go from retrospection to the, to the, to the future. Uh, so you can do what you want, but I would suggest, ask your assistant to re- rewrite this script in chronological order so that this will give you a lot more freedom in editing. So if you find out that in a script, if something is in the wrong place, it's always easier to make a certain transition. There was no discussion about quality. The film now has no flashback and no future scene, not a single one. And this is exactly what allowed us in a color correction in Los Angeles, allowed me to say, Natalie, you are a great director, you could you could divorce your juvenile beloved idea. What you did is very mature. Uh, the, because, all, for example, all the films of Kishlowski are very far from the original script. Uh, we read, we got the scripts which are not the scripts, the working scripts uh, were not the films that we finally made. The scripts that are being published right now, of course, are not the working scripts, but the final scripts which are made in the editing room. There are, you know, there are no all, all the there are whole sequences which are not not non, not existent in the script. They are being made in the on the set. So this process of transformation is necessary, and it's very important to remember about that. That making a film one to one with a script. Uh, it's, it doesn't mean that the script is wrong. It's, it's, it's made by live people and, the ima- and how the actor will imagine his role and how, it's, how he's going to play it or her, she's going to play it. You know, it, it changes everything. Let's say you wrote a script. What, uh, so what if you wrote it from the point of view of a, of a, of a, of a, of a guy where he has a lux, he's a totally lackluster and she's a totally charismatic? You change everything, you know? The whole uh, audience will be looking at her. The certain method of translation of a script into a film is extremely important and its, it's basic value, I, of course, I'm not undermining the value of the script. It, I'm very far away from that. Nevertheless, it's never one-to-one. My experience tells that sometimes up to 40% of change, the, the, the script changes up to 40%. Sometimes even the, uh, the whole sequence is changed. The script uh, sequence and the editing sequence are two totally different things. The, the, the balance between subplot and plot. Quite often subplots are being deleted because oh, the plot is weak. Quite often the directors who are tired and weary of their plot, they uh, 
do a lot of subplots. Yes, but I also have a question because you mentioned during your lecture that you're working on a feature film which you would want to do on a cinebus. I don't yeah, don't I understand if you yeah, if you well yeah, you would like to make a, a feature film in a yeah, cinebus. Are you looking for a script? No, 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 no. No, I'm I'm working every day on my surfing yeah. skills. We are looking for the. We are looking for a project which which could be done by Cinebus, and uh, and because all this description of the new production model is ours. So on the part of Film Spring Open, I wrote this essay, but it's I'm not the author. There, it's uh, the fruit of many discussions with different people, many external ideas, and also many experience from different uh, plans. Uh, we do not to perform that according to a certain rule. It should be done by some external company and we would, would just want to add something with, as a uh, producer an analysis. We want to add someone who would have no executive role in the film whatsoever, so have no influence on the film. Or but he, their role would be to compare the new system uh, in terms of savings and, lo and costs. We are not trying to be... Uh, this risk management does not pertain to the financial effectiveness. We're talking about the security of creativity. I believe that the, the um, getting a guy from CGI, for example, uh, you know, we can get, uh, we might need to uh, employ somebody like that for a longer time uh, than in uh, in a situation when they get the edited film and the effects are being um, used already in the, in the final cut. Uh, but I will give you uh, an, a recent idea: the the film of the last film of. Vida. They didn't have the, this film finished and they uh, sent it to me already where, where the guy had the blue legs and the blue arms and there were, and there were blue backgrounds. You know, uh, you know, when I when I see the guy who's uh, who's just pretending to be uh, a cripple, uh, it does not work, you know. Vida was a guy who, if he could see without all those elements, he would change the editing. This could not, uh, the thing that I got could not be uh, judged because without the finished visual effect, you cannot really judge them. I wanted to ask you uh, how should you how should you make the financial f financing plan for the previs? How much expensive is the film with the previs? Of course, it is always an investment, especially time investment. By first of all, you have to remember about one thing which might be very costly. If you want to do previs with real actors, uh, with a with a star actor, they will not do that for free. And here. Uh, we are dealing with se more serious money. But it's like thinking aloud. I didn't do a previs, so I, uh, but I, I have some experience about which I will tell you. I think it's even better to do uh, substitutes from a filming school. <laughs> this, they will, of course, not reflect the behavior of real actors, but you can, you will realize a lot of things. I uh, assess that if you had 1,000, well, 10,000 Polish lotis, and you can, but you, of course, uh, you can also edit this on your own laptop. And maybe if you wanted to add something that might be some additional cost. Uh, I, I think that 10,000 zlotys is enough. But you just need a producer and analyst. And we've been, uh, we did three years ago the Previs competition, and the condition was that the Previs was no shorter than 40 minutes. 
I thought that I will get four, maybe five films. There were 13 films made. That was absolutely incredible. People had to do it for, for their own money. But many Polish institutions which produce films uh, agreed to take part in the competition. So if a film won, it had some guarantee of production. And the film which got the prize, it did not win because you know the jury did not decide to produce it, but to, 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 to select it, but but uh, uh, but the film was very on one hand very good, but it had many many vices, many many drawbacks. I met the director. Uh, I met him in a festival a few years ago. Uh, you know his premise was about Star Wars. You know uh, millions for budget for 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 a beginner. But the film he did was not a big film, but it was a very good story. It did, did not get a prize in the festival, but it, it get, uh, had favorable reviews. And he said, he came to me and said, this competition saved my life. I would spend my next 10 years really uh, trying to st struggle with this huge film. And then I, when I saw a previous, I understood that it makes no sense. And it was an example when he loved this idea. He loved his script. He was loved in this concept. And he invested two weeks of his time. And in two weeks, after two weeks, when he saw it, he understood that it's a mistake. It's, quite, it's also like that in the beginning uh, that our uh, uh, our beliefs, uh, coming back to Yagoda, she said that all this process about the film school is that in, in the beginning I was a mute. I, I could not speak. I thought that everything can be expressed in images. Her background is art school. And she started with making short forms. I, it's, it's, I'm not quoting it directly right now, but this more or less what she said. Previs also allows us for a certain linguistic uh, um, training. We have to understand that the biggest problem right now is that we are one step back uh, to technology. The 3D did not die because it was the bad technology, but but there were no good films with 3D. You would get 2D films to, into 3D to get more money, to squeeze more money from the audience. And the audience just turned their backs uh, on, the, on this technology. It wasn't a bad technology, but we as artists, we were late. There were no interesting suggestions for this. Even the thing that was functioning quite well there, uh, so how they got this uh, effect of vertigo, in a 2D film, it does not, you know, if we're not we're not really astonished when somebody's standing on the on the edge of the rooftop. You know, people in the 30s died out of uh, fear when they saw a camera looking from a rooftop. Now, these preschool children do not really care about that. They've seen all that. All this category of action films, we're not doing realistic action films. Um, if they were re made realistically, nobody would really care about that in a cinema. It is super realism. It's a total super realism. It's a, it's a total lie. Making action films and action scenes is, is an intelligent way of lying. I will, if, you, if you want to analyze, if you want to, I can analyze that for you uh, outside because it's not good for streaming, that how we have lied on all sets. Uh, uh, if you look at the black hole hog down, if you, if you showed it to a professional soldier, uh, if, if he analyzed it uh, frame after frame, he would say it's stupid. But even professional pr uh, soldiers say they love the film. And it's, it's just a very good line. You know, we had a cinema scope, like, like this, this frame. So the, in order to get this in, 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 in order to have this, uh, this film, we, we had to have this helicopter flying 40 meters over the ground. And it's, you know, it, then it would be vulnerable to boys with stones. Uh, such uh, helicopters cannot fly uh, at such a low um, altitude. Usually they fly at 500 meters, and they were always flying in my film very low. Uh, well, the, uh, the cloak and sword films, you've got the, the horses, the, the explosions, you know, you know, we've got horses running and and huge explosions between the, between the, uh, the horses. We call it add some more shit. Where did you have explosions in the, uh, in the uh, battlefields in those times? 
of nas było trzech you know there were three of us I operating the camera and you op in order to, to add emotion then you shake the camera so there were three guys there was an Italian guy who was shaking the camera like that the English a bit less so I was just like shaking this just slightly the director could the director had a choice whether he wanted to make to, to get a very shaky image he got it from the Italian guy and if he less shaky he got it from me if somebody looks at that uh, when working on the set he thinks he thought he would think we we're idiots but it's all for pumping the emotions you know it's pumping the emotions up Okay. The group which is interested in the uh, in the new production model is still waiting. I'm still waiting. We can meet in a in a cafe somewhere. I'm here available for you if you want to get some detailed discussion because not everybody interested in details. So if you want to talk to me, I'm more than willing to to um, have a chat with you. Your projects. You have your projects. Of course, I will not read your projects here. Um, I will fly to uh, Africa and I will read it here. I hope it, it's it's not going to be too windy because if it's windy, I'm not reading then. And we can talk about that. Thank you very much. Piotrek Reimer, tu jestem. It's Piotrek, can I tell you a few words about this accident of ours? Because you probably don't know. The operator was is Piotrek Aleksowski, who, who was shot. He was the operator who did Cześć Teres. Hello, Tereska. But I would like to ask you, if you have an accident like that uh, on the set, do not pretend that there was no accident and that nothing happened. And do not write to the producer, do not sign uh, the papers for the producer that you will not say and the same thing because it's too serious. This is the situation in the set right now and I'm, so, I'm really sorry that uh, half of our community turned their back on the man and pretend they do not him. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really a nasty, it's really nasty nasty situation. There were plenty of nasty situations in the Hollywood. People are afraid of uh, people are afraid to lose jobs, and they stop to control their, uh, you know, themselves morally. And it's really a sad and sorry state of, of life. You know, film is as film is a play. But it stops to be game a game when you get an accident on the set, and accidents do happen, and especially, uh, and as, especially, especially on the sets of young filmmakers. I will not tell you what I did when I was young. It was ab an absolute scandal. But I was young and stupid. I thought it's it, it's uh, it's funny, but it was not funny at all. And I and the consequences could have been grave. So regardless what you remember from this uh, lecture, remember safety first. Thank you very much.